we want better performance for free. So unlabeled data is cheap, uh, it, but labeled data can be very hard to get. So human annotation can be very boring. Labels might require experts, which might not have time to do it. Uh, and also labels may require special devices, like uh, if you're doing DNA sequence. And the last one, your graduate students is on vacation. So generally you just throw a bunch of images at them and say, please, can you just put, draw a box around all, tag all the cars or whatever you're doing. It's like a computer vision problem. And I've seen this at Hopkins there. They do it quite often because you're building the data set you're going to train on. So anyways, you need to do it. But uh, not very happy exercise. This is why we want to not squander human intellect and energy on labeling data. We want to build machines who would do that for us, right? So some labeling tasks are way easier than others. In that case, you might use supervised learning. So if it's so easy to automatically label, that is fine. But if it's very time consuming, you want you want to go with unsupervised, if it's possible, or semi-supervised, which, which is in between. Now, the goal, what is the goal? So let's look at the goal. The goal is using both labeled and unlabeled data to build better learners, okay, than using each one alone. So in the training, we're using both labeled and unlabeled. So this is, you know, these are the notations that we're using. Uh, what we have, we have an input instance or a sample, x and its corresponding label. We have, we want to learn a mapping function or a learner uh, that will map the input to the output, okay? So the labeled data, what we have, we have labeled data and unlabeled data. The labeled data is noted as um, XL for the feature matrix, YL for the target output. And what we have, we have L instances, okay? So we have from one to L samples with their corresponding labels. For the unlabeled data, it's unlabeled, so it's XU, okay? And we only have a few, uh, we, we only have, we, we have actually many samples because N is uh, much uh, larger um, than L, okay? So much greater than L. Here, what we also have, which is very important, so during the training, we have access to all these, you know, to both labeled and unlabeled data. But during the testing, uh, we also have a testing set that is hidden, and what we have is the same thing as supervised learning. It's just the features for the testing samples, okay, the feature vectors. Okay, so this is how we frame the whole thing. Now, how can uh, unlabeled data ever help? So this is an example. I would like you to look at it and think about it. Just read through it and think about why in this case, in this simple scenario, unlabeled data might help get her a better get a better classification between uh, the labeled points. So what do we have here? We have only two labeled data points. Point one belongs to class one, and we have a second labeled point. Point two belongs to class two. Now, if we were to draw the decision boundary or the classifier line, right, uh, in this linear space. Uh, one-dimensional space between our points using only labeled data. Where would I put my line? It will go through which number? Here. Zero. Yes. So I will put my line right there. So this is my first decision line if I am using only labeled data. Okay? So if I use unlabeled data, and imagine all of those guys now, they're like very close to these. So this is, you know, this is my, my unlabeled data and how it sits in my space. So where would I put the line? I will put it somewhere around here, okay, in the middle, maximizing the distance between these two clusters or classes, okay? Classes in this case, because supervised learning, okay? So what do we have? We have a big shift in the, in the decision boundary. So what unlabeled data allows to do when we integrate it is, let's say, for example, if we classify this data point using uh, the first line, we will make a mistake because we will put it, we'll label it as green, but it's closer to the yellow ones, right? So you can see that 
using the uh, the uh, decision boundary for unlabeled and labeled data, we get we might get her, get better classifiers trained, right? So this is a very simple example, and you can try to come up with different scenarios uh, with your small sketches. Now, how to train a semi-supervised uh, learning model? So I'm gonna explain the algorithm you just mentioned. It's called self-training. Okay, so this these steps define the uh, defines the uh, concept of self-training. So the basic assumption is one's own high confidence predictions are correct. So if I can learn how to uh, label a point as um, as you know belonging to class one or class two with high confidence, then I will add it to my training set. This is the assumption. So here the first step is. First step is train F from X, L, Y, L. So this is just supervise, okay? Using just labeled data. Now, I'm gonna test the train supervised model classifier on the unlabeled data, all of them, okay? All those like purple points. Next, what I will do, I will add to the labeled data my X and F of X, which is the predicted label, okay? So now how I'm gonna add it, this is, there is a like there is a there are many heuristics to do so. One easy idea is I want to pick the um, the x which has the the high like what what I say a high uh, confidence score if I have access to this value. Okay, so if I'm very confident that this point I predicted it with a high confidence and the confidence range is for example between zero and one. If I have zero point nine and this has the highest confidence amongst all other points that I labeled, I take that one and add it. And then retrain the model again. So I go back, retrain the model. Now, of course, I integrated this. This one is now in my new set. I've added one point. I retrain it. I predict on the other remaining unlabeled data, and I do this progressively. So every time, if we look here, what I'm doing, let's say, hypothetically, the first point, uh, after predicting, I have, this one is very close to all of them, so this one I say, I can predict as green, as a cross, because uh, I have a very high confidence score about labeling this point, so now I'm extending my labeling, uh, my training set, I'm training the supervised algorithm uh, <coughs> once again. And then once I train it, I'm going to test it on the other subject, on the unlabeled data. So in the next run, maybe, maybe I'm saying this point has the highest confidence. It's just surrounded by all these points, okay? So I'm going to add it. I increase my training data by one more sample and then retrain. And I'm going to do this progressively until all my points are labeled. Okay, this is one strategy. You can also do it all like at once, which means you're just training once and predicting on all. But there might be some problems. There are all, there's always problems. So this is, you know, the idea of semi-supervised learning. So you guys get that. So it's just, you know, the unlabeled data intervenes in the training stage alone. Now we have uh, many variations of self-learning. I want you to, th I just mentioned two, which is, you know, test on all points and add them at once or add them progressively one by one. Or the third variation is like you can say, I will add the top two most uh, uh, confident points with the highest score. So you're adding K points at each iteration. K in this case equals two. That's third variation. Now the last part of this lecture today is something so cool. So what we call, we call semi-supervised learning as inductive learning. Okay, so what is inductive learning? Inductive learning, it means that we're, we're trying to infer general laws from particular instances. If, if you remember what we saw before, one of the rules is going from the particular to the universal. Okay, so here, our particular, our, the laws that we're inferring is from the labeled and unlabeled data, and then we're learning something, we're learning the classifier uh, parameters, that is the law, okay? And then we're applying it, we're testing it on unseen data, that is the generalization of the model, 
So we're testing an unseen. There is an, a test set in this scenario. Now, the ultimate goal is to apply the learned semi-supervised model to the test set. Okay, so what you have for this model, you have labeled data, and you also have unlabeled data that you're going to use, and you have a test set, okay, in general, for training and testing. So here, this is for training, and this is for testing. This is going from the particulars to the universal, where you want to generalize on many unseen samples. Generalize on unseen data. Okay? Now, there is another concept. This is where, where we're talking about inductive learning. You're in inducing um, some laws. There is also on the other side an, an interesting concept, and we call it tra transductive learning. So what is transductive learning? You can read through here. So this is another type of learning. It doesn't fit into semi-supervised. Semi-supervised is purely inductive. So transductive learning means it's, it, that the algorithm is only concerned with the unlabeled data. Okay, so what we're doing is we are training and evaluating your mo the model using some labeled samples and unlabeled samples. So this is, you know, considered, the unlabeled data in this case is considered as the test, somehow the test set, okay, but it's internal. We wouldn't have any hidden test set. So the algorithm will do, look, we go back to this scenario, right? The algorithm will do its best to label those unlabeled samples, and that's all we care about. We don't care about how the model will be, um, you know, will generalize to unseen data or test data. So how do we evaluate generally a, a semi-supervised learning algorithm? Generally, we don't care about how well it labels the unlabeled data. We only care about the performance we get once we test on the unseen data. So let's say we train it using label and unlabeled data. We use some strategy that we came up with to label the unlabeled data using strategy one, like variant one, for example, adding one at a time will give me 60%. Adding two at a time will give me 62%. All I care about is using strategy do gave me better results on the test samples. Okay, now this is inductive. Transductive, it means I don't have any test samples. All I care about is how well I perform on the on labeling those unlabeled data. So I'm gonna uh, Kim, I'm I'm gonna somehow look at those data and see how how good my uh, labeling would be in this case of these unlabeled samples. So you can it's like you know the unlabeled data in this case is your test sample. So you're learning together using testing and training, solving the problem together. So in your function, it's gonna take everything. Okay, so this is the difference. Now, let's look at this. So, transductive learning, it was uh, pioneered by um, uh, Vladimir Papnik in 1990, and he uh, gave this nice definition. So, he said, when solving a problem of interest, do not solve a more general problem as an intermediate step. Try to get the answer that you really need, but not a general one. So your answer is just using what you already have. You don't care about what you don't have or the unseen samples. Okay, so this concept also, I'm going to explain it a bit more, but it's um, there is another word that we use. Uh, it's called uh, epilogism, and it's derived from the Greek word uh, epilogus, and it means uh, we are trying to um, infer which we only explore. Okay, so for example, what which we are only allowed to see. So is it, it's, uh, um, epilogism is an inference which only explores the domain of the visible and evident things, what we observe. So in this case, our training data. It does not consider the unobservable, which is the hidden test data. Okay? So this is, you know, also another uh, synonymous or definition of uh, transductive learning, um, epilogism, just for you guys to uh, know it in case you see it in some papers. Now... Let's look at this scenario. Why transductive learning sometimes might be better than semi-supervised learning? Yes, sorry. Uh, I think that this transductive learning should be an intermediate step on all the learning 
algorithm because uh, should it be like if we label the unseen data correctly as translated or not, shouldn't we get better result, better generalization? So why are we not using all of these algorithms, but just in the unlabeled labeling the unlabeled data? That's that's a good question because it is some sometimes it's inherent. Like you can there is some transductive learning and uh, many like um, as a subpart of an, a bigger algorithm. But the idea is sometimes you don't really have any, um, you don't have a lot of labels. Like for example, in this scenario, let me know if I answer your question uh, correctly. Uh, so in this case, what do we have here? We have some points that are labeled. How many classes? We have three classes, right? So we have two, one, and two. So we have five points. Can we train a semi-supervised model using these just five points to learn how to label all of these guys? For training supervised models where you're using the labels, learning just from five labels to separate three classes, it's impossible. So using semi-supervised, which means first you're relying and you're trusting that your supervised model will do very well because it has a good performance, then you're going to test it on unseen data to you know, progressively add one at a time. But if you have a very, very small number of labeled points, then what you can do is say, okay, I'm not going to use, um, uh, what I'm, I'm going to look at all the points together, like all these labeled and unlabeled points. I'm going to consider their relationship. I'm going to look at them all together, and I am allowed to look at the labels. I am allowed to look at the non-labeled data and consider all together, build some, you know, like maybe uh, look at their local um their, their structure, their distribution in the space, and this is only allowed in transductive learning. You're allowed to look at all data at once, okay? So in this case, if you're looking at all of them, not just looking at some points, then you might zoom out and see that there is some structure and it's very easy to actually label and solve this task if you're allowed to look at all of them. So this is, you know, what uh, is transductive learning is doing. It's looking at all of them at the same time and evaluating on the unlabeled data okay so right so in this case only uh yeah so this is the problem only five labeled instances so inductive learning might fail or struggle uh, and if we consider all points when performing the labeling task like uh, transductive uh, we can make better prediction with fewer labeled points so this is the main ID 